Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. This is our annual Missions and Evangelism Lectureship Week. And this year's Mission and Evangelism Ship Lecture is Mark Job. He serves as the head pastor of the New Life Community Church in Chicago, an urban ministry with a multi-site outreach uh, that is uh, going to be tremendous to hear about. I'm sure you will agree with me as you do. His series title is called Dangerous uh, People on Mission with God. He spent the first years of his life in South America and Europe where his parents were involved in pioneering missions work. And after receiving his undergrad degree from uh, Columbia International University, he went on to complete a master's at the Moody Graduate School. And in 1986, he has been involved, since 1986, he's been involved in a ministry in Chicago, uh, pastoring for 23 years. And under his leadership, the New Life Community Church has grown from a handful of people to a dynamic, diverse, multi-site church uh, that hosts about 4,000 every weekend. He has been a contributing author to various periodicals and magazines. He's a frequent conference speaker with a passion to see this generation awaken spiritually. Pastor Mark and his wife Dee have three children and view themselves as a team in ministry. Mark, it's great to have you on the campus of Dallas Seminary. Would you join me in welcoming Pastor Mark Joe? Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here with you uh, this morning. And I want to acknowledge, uh, well, for two people I want to acknowledge. I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Mike and Penny Polcock, who actually 24 years ago, they did our premarital counseling. And uh, something worked because we've been married for 24 years. So if you're here thinking about getting married, you know who to go to. And uh, Penny is here. Penny, would you stand, please? I know they get to see your husband around, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, I worked hard at dragging my wife here. And she typically doesn't like to go when I'm speaking in colder climate, but she said, Dallas, okay. And this is my wife, Dee. Dee, would you stand, please? <laughs> the much better half of our ministry. Now, it's challenging to, uh, it's challenging actually for us to leave home, both of us at the same time, because we have a 17, a 15-year-old, and a 10-year-old. And if you knew my 10-year-old, you'd know why it's a dangerous thing to leave him alone. Uh, even though he's being babysitted, he has broken six bones by the, eight, by the time he was eight years old. Um, he is fearless. Uh, we got a house with a balcony in it, and uh, just the second week in there, my wife caught him with a measuring tape, and he was measuring from the balcony down to the couch, and she said, what are you doing? He said, I wouldn't die if I jumped, and it's like, no, no, you will not go there. You will not go there. And of course, if anybody was to get sick, he was to get sick, and so sure enough, I was in Spain two weeks ago preaching over there. And the day I got back, my wife said, Grant has the swine flu. And sure enough, he caught it. He told me he didn't like me to call it H1N1 influenza because that sounded serious. He'd rather call it swine flu. So I referred to it as swine flu. And of course, his 15-year-old brother thought for sure he was going to get contaminated. So he sprayed things, walked around him like this. <laughs> and my 10-year-old, who has a mischievous bent in him, said, Dad, uh, said to my son Josiah, he said, uh, hey, you want me to do an impression of Darth Vader? Hi, how are you? Trying to spread some of those germs. He was in Awana a little bit ago, and his Awana teacher told me this. She said she was in an Awana class. This was uh, a couple of years ago. He was probably seven years old. And she happened to put her foot on a chair, and she broke the chair. And uh, my son said to her, you know, my dad's the pastor, right? <laughs> and she looked at him and said, yeah, I know he is. Don't tell him, she said. And he, he's been in Chicago too long. He whipped out a hundred bucks and I won't tell him. It's like, Lord, we need to get this kid out of the city fast, fast. 
So now you know it takes an act of faith to be here. <laughs> Over the next couple of days, we want to talk about uh, what it means to be on mission with God. And I'm under the understanding and conviction that most of the men and women that are here in this chapel going to this institution, you are here in large part because you feel like you do have a mission and that you are called like every follower of Jesus Christ because I believe that every follower of Jesus Christ is called. There are not the called and the non-called ones. If you've responded to the call of Jesus, implicit in the gospel uh, acceptance is a call to a mission and to a lifestyle. But there are those of you that are here getting extra training because you feel like God has called you in a particularly dynamic, uh, more full-time way to some of the purposes and missions of God. And over the next four uh, days, I want to talk to you about that because I do believe that um, I'm excited about this generation, and I'm excited about what God is doing, and I'm excited about the times that we live in. I think that we live in a time with the greatest opportunities than we have seen in decades, maybe in centuries. But at the same time, I think we live with some of the greatest dangers that we've seen in centuries that are facing Christianity. And... I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 4. This morning I want to talk to you about the call. Tomorrow I'm going to talk to you about the people. I believe that God's strategy to reach this world is not a new strategy. I believe that we don't have to come up with a new strategy. I believe that Jesus gave us the strategy. His mission was all about the kingdom, but his strategy was all about the church. And he's imparted the DNA of the kingdom within the church, and it is his vehicle by which this world is changed and reached. That's why I'm a pastor. I've pastored one church all my life. I haven't had the opportunity of candidating. I haven't had the opportunity of going before boards. Um, I started at one church when I was 21 years old, really trying to get them a real pastor. I said, hey, I'll be here three years until you can get yourself a real pastor. And uh, 23 years later, I'm still pastoring that church in the same city. I'm still trying to get him a real pastor, but we're working on that. <laughs> you find in Exodus, Exodus chapter 4, one of the most bizarre stories that you can find in the entire Bible. In fact, this is really a scene, if you would just take a snapshot of this, it's a scene really out of a horror flick. Uh, Let's look at it for a moment. Moses has been called by God. You know the story, the burning bush, the 40 years in the desert. He's been called by God to do something that he really is uh, reluctant to do. God's calling him back to a people that he left back with a, a really specific mission. And he's responded, yes, he's had the burning bush experience. He packs up his boys, takes his wife. They're on their way. They stop at a cheap motel. And here's the grim scene that we see at this cheap motel. You know, if they had motel fives or sixes, maybe it was that in those days. They pause there. There is blood on the floor. There's a woman with a sharp rock trickling with blood from it. There's a boy on the floor yelling in pain. There's a man on the bed that is close to death, and the woman has a crazed look in her face. You probably didn't even know that scenario existed in Moses' life, right? Uh, what, was, what was it that led to this bizarre scenario? Well, you may have read it before because it's kind of an interesting verse, really an unexpected verse, but in verse 24... It says, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Hold on, pause. Take a breath. What was Moses doing? Running from his call? No, no, no. He wasn't a Jonah. What was about to happen here? Moses was on his way to fulfill the call that God had given him. He talked to his father-in-law. 
He was going back to the place where God had called him. He had tried to resist it. He had made a commitment. He had packed up his bags. He had taken his family. He was on his way to his mission field, on his way to his call, and God gets so ticked at him that he's about to strike him dead. It just seems strange to me that the God that calls you a couple days later is ready to strike you dead. You say, well, Pastor Mark, that really doesn't, I mean, I don't think he really meant that. No, it says it. It says it in the text. And it says, and God and the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Now, when I read something in the Bible, I take it literally, about to kill him, that it was God's intention there to strike him dead. What would the story look like of the liberation of the people of Israel if that would have happened? Well, I don't know exactly what it would look like, but here's, I, here's what I do know, that, that this would be just an anecdote in history of saying, and God called this fellow by the name of Moses, and because he didn't respond right, he was killed dead. He was killed, and then God would have raised someone else to do it because God always has a plan. And I ask myself, what is it that raised the wrath of God such a way to such a degree that the very person that he called, he's about to kill on a mission with God? Clear vision, I know what I'm supposed to do, set the people of Israel, speak on behalf of God, set them free. Why was God about to kill them? Well, we look at what happened here, and I, here's what I want you to understand. This is really important. When you consider your call, and, I, and again, every one of us here are called. When you consider your call, on the way to your call, be very careful and make sure that there's no unfinished business. Because some of us, I know when I was uh, studying in school, I spent a lot of time, God, what am I going to do with my life? And what have you called me to? And I spent a lot of time debating the call and my mission and where I was going to spend my life. And if you would have asked me as a college student on my way to my God-given call what I was going to do, I would have told you very specifically, listen, I'm planning to go to northern Spain. There's a people in northern Spain called the Bas people. They speak Euskera. They are very unevangelized people, and I plan to go to the Basque country in northern Spain and establish some sort of ministry of evangelism in that place. I had my plans laid out. I spent a lot of time thinking about my call, my mission, what I was going to do. But I wish in retrospect I would have spent a little bit more time also asking myself this question, am I ready for the call? Am I prepared? Do I have unfinished business in my life that needs to be dealt with before I really engage heavily in the call that God has called me to? And if you look at this passage, you see a couple of things that pop out to us. I believe that the essence of why God was so angry with Moses and was about to kill him was the fact that, Mo that Moses had directly violated some of the commandments of obedience that all the people of Israel had been called to, primarily the commandment of circumcision. Now, circumcision to us seems like some uh, sort of archaic practice that uh, we don't necessarily elevate to a big place today, but for the Jewish people, it was a sign of commitment. It was a sign that they were part of the uh, chosen people of God. It was a consecration of the body that symbolized a consecration of the heart. And for whatever reasons, we're, we're not told, but for whatever reasons, uh, Moses, maybe because he married Zephora, and Zephora was a Midianite, not that accustomed to the Jewish uh, practices and cultures, maybe she looked at it and thought, this is barbaric. I mean, I'm not going to take this little boy, and it's painful. I remember my two boys when they went through the process. I'm sure glad they were babies. And, you know, I received them right after their circumcision. Man, they were crying, and I'm like, I'm glad it's you, buddy, not me at this time. And that, that's a painful deal. Um, I believe that you had an overindulgent mother 
and a husband that possibly compromised because of it, although he knew what the commands were. Maybe it was his Egyptian upbringing, but for whatever reasons, he had not followed through on this. And it was an issue of consecration of him and his entire family. And the way it plays out, I'm not sure there's scholars that debate about what exactly happened in this room, but the way I envision it is that it comes to a place where God is about to kill Moses, Zephora, his wife, who should not be the one that had having to do this it should have been Moses now maybe at this point in time Moses was ill lying on the bed half dead I don't know but for whatever reasons it was Zephora that took the rock a rock and I can just imagine it imagine it he's not a little baby anymore and he may be 12 13 14 years old we don't know exactly how old he is and she's saying come here junior imagine mommy why do you have that rock? <laughs> Come here, Junior. Moses possibly on the, dead, uh, on the bed, almost dying, gasping for air. God's about to kill him. She's in a panic. She's chasing him down, wrestling him down, uh, circumcises him there with a rock. It's bloody. It's messy. He's yelling. Uh, it doesn't tell us that they circumcised the youngest one. He's probably really running. Um, after they see what they've done to his brother. And I, I can just imagine the conversation when he's 24. Nowadays, he'd be in a therapy group talking about, well, my mother, when I was 14 years old, I still have flashbacks of that, and it really, it really bothers me. And, you know, I, I can imagine nowadays how it would look, but she is chasing this guy down. She circumcises him, circumcises him, looks at Moses, and, 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 and in a disparaging way says, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Look what I had to do for you. And in essence, Zephora had to take a place that should have been Moses' responsibility, but here's what happens. When there is unfinished business in our life, the closer we get to the place of our call, engaging in our call, the bigger issue it becomes to God. Now I'm thinking to myself, God, why didn't you tell Moses around the burning bush? I mean, why did you wait to this moment? Well, here's the thing. The closer you and I get to the call, to fully engaging in the call that God has placed upon us, the, full, the closer we get to the full place of our destiny where God has placed us, then the greater issue it is to God, the unfinished business in our life. And what may not have been a big issue when you were in high school and just trying to figure out life, you're older now, you're more narrowed in your focus, you're more engaged in what God is calling you to do, and that unfinished business will come back to bite you at very inconvenient times in life because the closer you get to your call, the bigger issue it becomes to God. I was obsessed about what I was going to do. I, I couldn't quite figure it out. I was uh, downtown at Moody Bible Institute. I hated the city, by the way. I grew up in a little town by the name of Rubena in northern Spain. I still remember my telephone number. It was Rubena 8. <laughs> there was only eight telephones in town. I mean... The streets were unpaved. On my way to school, I had to, I, I had to jump around the little droppings that the sheep and the cow left through the middle of the town. I literally went to a one-room schoolhouse. If you've ever seen Little House on the Prairie, you got a picture. There was 30 kids. One, uh, it was from kindergarten all the way through seventh grade uh, in a little Spanish school there where a teacher still believed in the rule of the ruler. And the pulling of the ears, the slapping of the back of the head. We had, this was a public school. We had a statue of the Virgin Mary behind. At the, behind. We had a picture of Franco, who was the fascist dictator that ruled Spain for many years at the front. And before we started classes every day, the kids would all stand up and they would say the Hail Mary and the Our Father in Spanish. This is a public school. And I went from there to, at the age of 17... 
And I, I have to blame this uh, in part on, on a person that's here present here, and that's uh, Dr. Howard Hendricks, because someone sent us, would send us tapes from founders. I had never been to Chicago, and I'd never been to Moody, I'd never been to the campus, and someone sent us tapes from Founders Week, and some of those tapes were from Dr. Howard Hendricks, and I thought, man, I want to go to a place, a school where they teach and preach like that. They tricked me. He wasn't even from the school. I, I went to the wrong school. <laughs> But anyways, God has his plan, right? He got me there, and I show up in Chicago, and th I was in for culture shock because I was, living on the, I was living on the 15th floor, 1502 of Colbertson Hall. For the first couple of days, I could not sleep. There was noise and siren. I mean, I grew up in this little village. In my town, when you pass someone on the street, you would nod and say hi to them. So my first walk downtown Chicago, I was saying hi to everybody. Hi, 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 hi. I thought, whoa, these people are pretty rude. No one talks to me. Finally, one guy said hi to me, and I thought, finally, a friendly person. Then he opened up his jacket and showed me all the stuff he had for sale and if I wanted to buy it. And I realized I'm in a different world, and I'm a different culture. There was no grass. There was no trees. I'm not a tree hugger, but I tell you, I was ready to hug a tree at that time. <laughs> if I would have found one in downtown Chicago, and I remember thinking to myself, God, get me out of this place as soon as you can. I'm here for an education. And there was all these people with urban emphasis and desire for the city. And I was like, man, I'm out of here. Put me on a plaza in northern Spain with a cafe con leche, sitting down there, sort of chatting and talking. And, hey, I'm there. But, but the middle of downtown Chicago, totally foreign culture to me. I was wanting to get out of there, wanting to run from that place. And uh, someone told me. A pastor spoke to me, and he deposited something in my heart that I just couldn't shake. He said, Mark, do you know that the cities of the world have become the melting pot or the attraction for the nations of the world, and that in this city of Chicago, there is every nationality, every ethnic group, there is practically every race that you could find on the face of this earth. And why don't, before you plant a church in Europe, why don't you think about planting one here in Chicago? Now, that's the last thing I wanted to hear. I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want that. No, 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 you're talking to the wrong person. But you know when God puts something in your heart, you can't shake it? You ever, you ever tried to shake a God word? Kind of shake it, but you can't. It just... It just stays there, and it simmers, and it grows. Well, that's exactly what happened to me. And so I found myself, by the time that I was, uh, I, I was graduating from Bible college, I found myself having said yes to this little church on the southwest side of Chicago in the back of the yards neighborhood, known as back of the yards because they used to have stockyards there. And I went there to help out for the summer. And my first meeting in this place, there were 12 people, and they had gone through a bad time, th this church had. And I was like, man, I don't want to be here. This place is going to close down anytime soon. And they did the craziest thing in the world. They said, would you be willing to come and be our pastor? I said, well, I'm not married. I haven't graduated from school yet. I don't know the city. I, I don't know this. And I remember they asked me that. They, they asked me in part because I was all they could afford at the time, really. Their package deal was $8,000 a year, no parsonage, no insurance. And, and I remember struggling with God. And, and, and I was working at a, at a can factory at the time. It was a summer job. I was pay, paying my way through school. And I was wrestling with God. And Finally, I said, God, I'll love whatever you want me to love because I felt like God was saying, would you love this people? Would you love this city? I'll love whatever you want me to love. I'll love this city if you want me to love it. Don't ask me to stay, though. <laughs> and I went back and I said, you know what? I will come back and I will help you out for three years max because I have a call. Help you out for three years until you can get a real pastor. And like many young people, like 
God had some unfinished business in my life. And one of the unfinished issues in my life was the issue of trying to do in the power of the flesh that which can only be done in the power of the Spirit. And I thought, this city needs me. These people need me. There are so many problems, so much brokenness, so many people that need to get out of gangs and, and uh, so many people addicted to drugs. And I rolled up my sleeves and I threw myself full-heartedly into what God had called me to. Again, I was single. I, I was living in, in, in an office space with a mattress on the floor and a lot of mice. And um, I could hear the gunshots outside of my window in the middle of the night. Once at 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up, looked out the window, and literally there was a gang fight right in front of where I was at, shooting at each other down the street. And, and I threw myself into it. And about three months into the ministry, I was sick as a dog. I couldn't swallow. I, 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 I had fever. I was uh, depleted. I was tired. I had no insurance. I got up to preach that Sunday morning in this little, uh, this little church, and I was praying, oh, God, don't let me pass out. Please don't let me pass out. And then um, I, I, I drove to my grandmother who, who, house in Indiana who had a doctor that agreed to see me for free, and he said, you have this, that, and the other. Basically, you need rest. You got to rest for a week because your health is very critical. And I remember laying on that couch thinking to myself, God, I don't understand this. You called me. I'm doing what I thought I am supposed to do. I'm throwing myself into ministry. People really, really need me. And sometimes it's only on our back that we're willing to listen, unfortunately. And I remember on that bed with fever, couldn't swallow, I remember getting my Bible and reading and the Holy Spirit speaking to me really strongly. And what I had done is I had placed myself, I had tried to be a little Messiah. And I remember the, the Spirit of God really convicting me about the fact that, listen, you are not the Messiah, I am the Messiah. There's only one Jesus. He died and resurrected. And what you are trying to do in your own strength and your own power will amount to very little fruit. I want you to seek me more. And I was convicted about my lack of prayer and I was convicted about my thinking that I could do these things on my own power and my own strength. And I'll, I'll never forget in my bed of sickness, repenting and crying, sobbing out to God, saying, God, forgive me because I've tried to do in my own strength, in my own power, in my own reliance, really what could only be done in the power of your spirit. I've tried to be a Messiah to people. I thought that you needed me, God. I thought that you really... Like, hey, God, you better be glad I'm on your team. And God so broke me, so convicted me, I got up off that bed and I remember uh, making a commitment to myself, God, I'm gonna spend... I, I, I'm, I'm going to spend much more time in prayer, much more time seeking you. I'm going to get grounded and centered. Whatever I do, I pray that I will do it in the power of the Spirit, not in my own flesh. I acknowledge my weakness. I, I repent because of my pride in thinking that anything could happen uh, because of my own strength and my own power. And I remember getting up from that a new man, an issue that I should have dealt with a long time ago unfinished business, unfinished business that God had convicted me about before, but that I needed to have dealt with a long time. It was an inconvenient time. It was a crazy time for it to happen. But nonetheless, the closer you come to your call, the more God demands a heart of consecration and dependence upon him. And the craziest thing started happening. It seemed like we worked less, but we started seeing these incredible conversions. I mean, diehard people that they had worked on for a long time, and suddenly this little church started get, getting filled. Now, we were a scary bunch. They're drug addicts and alcoholics and gangbangers, and I mean, it was, that's who we were reaching. I mean, the church was packed out. You didn't want to mess with our ushers, I tell you. <laughs> 
One of our ushers used to lead a prostitution ring, a gang, was in prison for five years. I discipled him right out of prison. And I remember a guy walked in the church and he said, I, I know you. <laughs> he said to our usher, last time I saw you, you had a sawed off shotgun pointed at my head. He said, oh, those are old days. Have a seat now. <laughs> and we're taking the offering up pretty soon. Give generously. No, he didn't tell him that. But. A crazy bunch of people. And man, what God showed me is his grace and his power. We had one gangbanger that came in and he would, uh, he would talk to the girls and, and flirt with the girls. And I don't know what he told them, but you know, they would turn red and, and start shaking while he sat. And so I warned him, hey, you come to church. I don't want you doing that anymore. Next time you do it, we're going to take you out. Like take you out of the church, not take you out. <laughs> you got to clarify those things when you're in Chicago inner city, right? And so during the worship, I saw him do, talking to a girl, and she was turning all red. And so I motioned to the ushers, both of which had been released from prison, and both of them who were ex-gangbangers. And they talked to him, and I saw him wrap his, it was a chair like this, wrap his arms and feet around the chair like this. And next thing you know, I'm trying to like continue to worship here, and next thing you know, one usher had one side of the seat, another had another, and they, they lifted him up and they're walking him down the aisle like this, and they put him out, out on the front steps of the church, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, help me, only in Chicago. But what God began to show me at that time is besides the fact that God has a heart for the cities and God loves cities, and, and, and I want to talk to you a little bit more about that tomorrow because I, I think it's huge. There's a couple of forces that are really uh, changing the face of this world and, and that you happen to live in an accelerated pace of change, globalization, urbanization and diversification are happening at this unprecedented rate. There are 360 cities in this world that have more than a million people. Those that are able to reach the cities are able to reach the countries. Those that are able to change the hearts of cities are able to change the centers of thinking, the centers of culture, the centers of music. They start in the city and they work their way out. You can go to the you can go to a suburb of Dallas with some, uh, some white kid that's going to a middle class school and his parents making $150,000 a year and he's listening to rap that was started in the streets of Chicago, New York and even dresses kind of like that because the music, the culture, the values oftentimes start in the city. As I have moved forward as a pastor in the city of Chicago, I've become painfully aware that issues that God was dealing with me in Bible school, in graduate school, that those very issues are pivotal issues that cannot be delayed because here's what, here's what I want you to understand and here's what I teach my, my, my kids. Delayed obedience is disobedience. You may chalk it up under the category of delayed obedience. Well, I haven't dealt with it yet, God. Well, it's something I'm gonna deal with. It's an issue. But I want to tell you, some of us have shelved our issues for so long that they're in the category of non-dealt with issue. And in your mind, you think that you're just delaying it, but you and God and the Holy Spirit understand and know that it's an issue that you've chosen not to deal with, just like Moses chose not to deal with the issue of circumcision. I'm sure in his mind, he thought, one day I'll get to it. One day when the setting's right. One day when it, everything is good and, and maybe we have a better, the kids are older, people understand, uh, whatever his scenario was, but he shelled a step that he knew he needed to take, and it was delayed obedience, and those issues of de delayed obedience that existed in the that existed in the trunk of his vehicle as he traveled towards his calling to that place where God were, was using him became more and more an issue to God, so much so that the wrath of God was there. And I want to say that the issues that God is dealing with you today 
You said, well, I thought this was supposed to be about missions and evangelism. That's exactly what I'm talking to you about. Because ultimately, the tools that God uses in missions and evangelism are people. And it's not that that world won't listen, and it's not that the gospel's not powerful, and it's not that, there are, that, that the fields are not white unto harvest. Oh, I believe they are. We saw over 300 people take the step of believers' baptism last year. Uh, tons of people that are open to Christ. What scares me the most is not the openness of people, is not the message of the gospel, not the faithfulness of God. What hinders the work of God the most are the people that God has called to carry forward that work. And it's issues that you are dealing with today that could make a difference, huge difference, between what happens tomorrow, your call, your ministry. And by the way, let me just throw this in as a freebie here. You're a married man, or you're thinking about getting married. We have our ministry to men in Chicago is called Man Up. And I don't know if they use expression around here, but in the city when, when a guy needs to like, hey, we, they say man up to it. Like, hey, step up to that. Take your place. You see a woman here resenting her husband because what he should have taken responsibility for with his children, his family, what he should have done fell on her shoulders and she ended up having to do what he should have done because of de delayed obedience. Because of his passivity and disobedience, there was a root of bitterness in Zephora as she looked at her children and said, this was your responsibility and you dropped the ball. I'm convinced that the masses of people around our world today, the six and a half billion people, I'm convinced that they're reachable. I'm convinced that there's a mighty harvest. I'm convinced that the cities are a key to that. I'm convinced that God is raising churches that not only affect neighborhoods, but can affect the DNA and the entire spiritual atmosphere of big cities. We're working hard at it in Chicago. And I believe that every major city in this world, I believe Dallas and Los Angeles and New York and Mumbai and, and Paris and Madrid, I believe that God is raising churches that can literally affect millions of people, but I, I'm most concerned, I am most concerned not about the opportunities, I'm most concerned about the integrity of the leaders that are being prepared to lead those movements and lead those churches. In a couple of days, I'll talk a little bit more about it. We have more onslaught now than ever before. Listen, men, you've been exposed to more pornography. You've been exposed to more pornography than any generation before you. What your grandfather had to do to, to go to some seedy neighborhood and uh, go to some back alley place and some XX adult store and get in there, go behind, a uh, go behind a curtain and see some video, some granular video of some pornographic thing, your 12-year-old can do three clicks of the mouse and have more explicit pornography exposure to in his life than your grandfather would ever dreamed of. And the truth is, the truth is, that 80% of, of you men in this auditorium today have dabbled in pornography, have exposed yourself to it, have had more exposure to it than you should have. You see, the call to consecration, to holiness, the call to, as we move towards our call, dealing with our issues, is one of the biggest factors in changing this nation, this world. Missions and evangelism, it's the carriers of the DNA of the gospel. It's us. It always has been, and it will continue to be. My challenge to you this morning as you consider the call of God in your life, as you think about where you're going to be, pastor and missions, whatever God has called you to, my challenge today, a simple word, do you have undealt with business in your life, delayed obedience, that as you move towards that incredible call, you need to ask yourself, have I dealt with it? I'm going to pray for you. 
I'm going to ask you to stand and then we're going to close. By the way, I'm going to be on campus for four days, so I'd be happy to talk with anybody, meet with anybody. Uh, I'm not a priest, I'm not a rabbi, so I'm not here to hear a bunch of confessions. Um, but I'm willing to talk with anybody, I'm willing to talk with anybody about any issues, especially related to your own personal call and uh, especially related to reaching our cities for God. Um, but I want to pray for you. Um, Father God, I pray for the men and women that are here today. I thank you that they do have a call. I thank you, Father, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful to change. I thank you that your message has not lost its power. I thank you, Father, that there are people here in this auditorium right now that if they deal with the business you want them to deal with, Father, that if they persevere and stay focused and are not afraid of it, that as they draw close to you, God, that what you could do through them, Father, has lasting effects on thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in the scheme of eternity, Lord. I thank you, Father, that that innate potential, power, vision, and calling us here, Lord. But I pray, O oh God, that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would surface those things that need to be dealt with today, not tomorrow. God, that, that those issues will, will be highlighted by your Holy Spirit, those issues that you have spoken to us oftentimes, but we have delayed, we've put them off, Father, and those issues that stir up your anger, Lord, that bring about your conviction, Lord. And I pray, God, that we would have the honesty, the vulnerability, the sensitivity of heart to deal with those issues now, God, so that they will not sabotage our calling and not derail us, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.